Hej. Hi everyone, I'm uh, Alessandro Zomparelli. I'm a computational designer, and uh, I'm also the developer of an add-on that is called Tissue. Um, I started to experiment with uh, digital tools, generative design, procedural modeling, you can call it how you want, in uh, the field of experimental architecture. And then, using 3D printing technology, I started to move to a smaller scale, working on uh, wearable devices, and then some uh, product design like medical devices and uh, other type of products. And I'm also involved in uh, different teaching programs where I teach the tools that I use in my work. So around 10 years ago, I would say, I started to collect some scripts, some tools that I was using in my daily practice. And uh, I started to collect them in an add-on that I called Tissue. And uh, this is something that was helping me in my work and I decided to share with the community because maybe someone else needed it for his work. And for me, it was also a way to try to advertise Blender that I was loving and I was thinking was a great tool, I still think that, um, to the people that was in my field. So for other computational designers, architects, it was just a way for me to convince them with a tool that they actually needed inside a software that was amazing already. Um, but uh, tissue, in my opinion, is something that can be useful for uh, generic modeling purposes. So what I would say is that if you are a lazy modeler, maybe when you have to approach something like a sci-fi helmet, you could approach it with a small component. You define the features that you want in your final object. Then you define a topology with those different materials and the loops that you like more. And this will inform the distribution of the components. So you can work procedurally without the need of uh, manually intervening in the modeling phases. But at the same time, everything is still related with actual 3D meshes that you can manipulate easily. And, uh, and of course, uh, it's something that I use in my teaching activities. So for example, we did a workshop in uh, Saudi Arabia, and it was about uh, modeling architecture for the metaverse. Now, the metaverse is a pretty fun playground for an architect because you can have fun, you can experiment with uh, your architectural language, and you don't actually care about how you're going to fabricate it because maybe you don't have to. And uh, we use tissue for this workshop. So, for example, imagine uh, you have a simple module like a wall, a piece of ceiling, and uh, a piece of floor, and uh, you can apply that to a square face. The same thing can be applied, for example, to the wedges of a polygon, of a square. And what happens is that that simple module becomes a column. So this works also with generic polygons and also with system of polygons. So the same thing, when applied to just a bunch of random polygons, can generate a kind of architectural system. And the same thing can be applied to a smaller scale, where you have your component that can be applied on the surface and that generate a more complex object and everything is procedurally linked. So you can define the feature of the main system, the, the feature of a smaller pattern, component, whatever you want to use, and you can just deal with easy modeling without dealing with a, a complex uh, node interface or scripting or whatever. And this is just a video that shows in practice how this works. And I have to say that while teaching to this type of audience, we are architects, we are designers, their goal is not to learn something complex. They want to do nice design. So for me, that this is a way that takes out of equation the complexity of the scripting of the nodes and just focus on the modeling. And I have to say that this is already challenging sometimes, because if you're not familiar with mesh modeling, understanding that the vertices should be aligned, otherwise they don't weld, it, it's, it's not that easy. And sometimes you spend a lot of time on very simple things and uh, it's just better to keep other stuff that is not necessary specifically for the design. So at the end, they were modeling some spaces, and the idea was you upload them on a platform, and then you can uh, share with colleagues, friends, or community, and they can explore the space that you, that you are creating. And uh, at the end of the workshop, every participant was designing his own space, and uh, we designed a main one that was kind of gathering some portals for the different spaces. And uh, this was like the, the main hall that you were entering in while visiting the uh, virtual installation. And here you can see a video that shows a different workflow, but based on the same principles. 
So again, very simple component. In this case, we added some materials because the materials can be used to inform different components in a second iteration. And you just manipulate a little bit, and then those are the components that are applied on top of that. And if you play smart with very low poly geometry at the end, we, if they combine well together, then you can, again, some, you can get something very complex. At the end, we added some texturing just because we wanted to reduce the number of total polygons, and that was helping adding an additional level of detail. And uh, the other tutor was instead focusing on generative uh, patterns using Houdini for those garments that was, were exhibited there. Uh, so everything is easy for the metaverse, but at some point, if you're an architect or designer, you may want to actually fabricate something. And this opens new challenges. But what is interesting also for a computational designer is that a challenge in the fabrication process can become actually an opportunity to explore a specific language or a specific strategy in the design. And uh, I developed this uh, additional tool in Tissue, which is the Contour tool. And this just allowed to create uh, slices of your geometry. And you can play with the angle, the distance, the offset, uh, blah, blah, blah. And also, there are some uh, other strategies that are just not planar slicing. And everything is non-destructive, so you can update the original geometry, refresh, and, uh, and just an easy uh, one-click way to generate those, those curves, something very basic. But it works well, for example, with 3D printing, if you want to actually design the printing path of your geometry. So imagine you want to 3D print something. Usually, you made a model, then another software make the slices, and then you print it. But instead, you can actually design the material that is going to be printed. And uh, usually, when you slice a geometry, you use horizontal planes. And this is fine. It works most of the time. But sometimes, you have problem according with ma some material that you're using and the geometry. Because if you have a certain angle, then the layers tend to uh, detach to each other. And you lose some cohesion between them. So an additional strategy that you can deploy is, for example, to use the geodesic distance in order to have offset of the curves along the geometry in order to have a kind of uniform distance between them. The version that is implemented in tissue is actually an approximation of a geodesic distance, but it works pretty fine for the job. Uh, some other time, if you want to instead ending your printing base, in this case, with a continuous closed uh, polyline or curve, you can use instead the topology distance, which is basically just a distance that counts the number of segments that you have in your geometry. So you have a very nice topology, very regular. This can create curves that start from the bottom and end on the top. That's it. This is something that we use in this project that has been developed in collaboration with VCU Arts in Qatar. And it was about a system, a simple system of smart blocks. And uh, what we did in this case was indeed to work with this strategy in order to start with a certain angle and then on a different angle and having the layers that were matching exactly the shape and the topology that we were making. We call that smart block because it allowed to be combined in a different way. Uh, here you can see how the layering of the printing is actually generating a texture that is part of a feature of the object that we wanted to create. And uh, when we are combined together, there is a kind of sense in how the texture is related with the shape of the element. And uh, it's called smart block because you can rotate in different way and, and do different type of composition. Uh, another iteration of this design is uh, this other version, always together with VCU Arts, and uh, is currently hosted in uh, Expo in Qatar. And uh, the idea in this case was to take inspiration from uh, the Mesh Rabia, which is an architectural element in the Arabic culture where you have a porous wall that regulates the sun, the temperature, and uh, the environment. And uh, we wanted to create a simple shape that is always similar, but playing with the position of the walls and the angles, we wanted to achieve a kind of variable opening of those components. It was a bit tricky because we had to 3D print and see if the angle was fine for the properties of the material, so it required some iteration with uh, uh, Bruno De Masi, that was the ceramic that was printing it. And we created a series of different components that were creating this kind of gradient. We isolated some uh, three different designs with three different levels of opacity. And uh, we were using them for reproduction. Of course, when you 3D print something, you can produce an infinite number of them. But just for convenience, we say, OK, let's, let's choose three of them. It's just easier to handle. So Bruno De Masi printed all of them. And then we selected some of them. And uh, they are currently exposed as small panels in, uh, during the Expo in Qatar. 
And uh, we created these uh, two versions. The first version is a derivation of the first design that I show you, and the second one is the one with the uh, opening and uh, closing. Uh, another part of tissue that is pretty old now is the reaction diffusion. Uh, for me, it was more like an experiment to see how I could implement a simulation inside Blender using scripting. Of course, now we have geometry node, we have simulation node, that would have saved me a lot of time, a lot of headache. At that time, I didn't have it, but I, I learned a lot, so it was, it was worth the time. And uh, these are a couple of videos that I created with this uh, sound designer that was adding some music to uh, the videos that I was doing. And for me, it was like an experiment just to stress a little bit the, the pattern and see what are the expressive possibilities of something that is uh, uh, extremely organic and also how to change the parameter over time, over the surface, just to, to explore what I could get from that. Mm -hmm. So as you can see, there are different areas with different effects. And uh, I, I wanted really to try to get an effect that wasn't like the conventional uh, reaction diffusion pattern, the one that you usually get right away. And also, this is happening on the level of the vertex group and also the vertex colors. So I was informing a displaced map together with some uh, uh, shader process, uh, uh, properties. The second one is using a different workflow. It's a more simple pattern, but I wanted to add uh, a bunch of modifiers just to add uh, some extra geometrical properties to that. This is something very simple at the end, I think, but this was actually the inspiration for uh, another project uh, that was a collaboration with uh, a fashion brand, which is called 3S4 and the Stratasys, which is one of the leading company in the 3D printing industry. And Stratasys developed this 3D, printing, the 3D printer that is able to print on fabric. They can print different materials with different colors. It's basically a resin, but they can change the opacity, also the consistency of the material. And uh, 3S4 had already quite some collaboration with them, so they know how the material works, how, how to deal with the, de the design. So they started to create a series of shapes, and I was taking those shapes as input in order to generate my reaction diffusion pattern. I was, for example, taking the outer edge in order to generate a gradient and having a variation in the scale. According to that, I was generating a vector field that was informing the direction of the reaction diffusion in order to have like a kind of twisting effect around uh, the specific shape. Then using some geometry node, I was just taking care of extrusion of very simple triangles along uh, geometry. And, uh, I generated a series of different shapes that then I sent to Stratasys for uh, printing. Uh, it's not visible here, but there was also uh, some uh, tuning using the UV coordinates in order to use a texture for changing the color, the opacity, and that was possible with the geometry node. Uh, here you see a detail of the printed pattern, and it's important to mention that all the different extrusions, they should not touch each other so that the fabric can still move and uh, be flexible. So they put together all the different pieces, and those are some details of a final garment where you can see a little bit the transparency, a little bit the color grading of the material. And this is the final piece. I wanted to create, to add the reaction diffusion to that because I think the shape was kind of suggesting this type of marine aesthetic, underwater aesthetic. Um, then I spent a couple of years in uh, Denmark working uh, with a create group in uh, the University of Southern Denmark. And uh, they are working on experimental architecture, dealing a lot with fabrication and computational design strategies. And uh, one of the projects that I did together with them was this uh, summer school, 2022. It was a project with the other researcher, with all the students involved. And uh, the idea was to design uh, a couple of slabs. And when you deal with structures, usually you have to deal with stress. And uh, when you have uh, some specific loading conditions, some support, you have a vector field that represents how the stress is moving in your, uh, in your geometry. According to this stress, there are some stress trajectories that are generated. And uh, in order to make a, an efficient use of the material, you may want to distribute the material along those specific directions. 
Sometimes with a stress trajectory is a bit tricky because they converge, they are not uniform, so there should be a smart way to use that information, but that generates something a bit more regular. So when I see that, I see the perfect food for a reaction diffusion pattern. So the reaction diffusion can change the density, can change its direction, and uh, because of its properties, kind of already find the perfect way to occupy the space according to a specific direction. So I did an implementation of the reaction diffusion that is based in this case on the texture uh, painting. The students were able to just provide different texture in order to control the scale of the reaction diffusion, the direction of the reaction diffusion, and then according to some parameters, you can change if you want, for example, to have some specific walls or if you want a more interconnected structure. That in structure, it works a bit better. So the student designed a couple of steps, one with so four supports, another one with two supports with a different angle, and they generated some maps that were used for generating the reaction diffusion. So they took the direction of the stress and they created an RGB image from the X, Y, and Z. And uh, they just generate a grayscale image for the intensity of the stress. And uh, of course, the pattern that was generated by the in interaction between them. And uh, using them, they generated the thickness of this lab while the height is affected by, is controlled by the intensity of the stress. And uh, at the end, we needed to mill it. Uh, when you mill with a robotic arm, or in general, where you're dealing with milling, there are some considerations that are not that far from 3D printing. Because, for example, if you want to reduce the, uh, the milling time, the time of the machine, that reduces also the cost, you may want to use a large step. But this generates a quite visible pattern of the milling path. So you have to play smart with that. So one of the strategies that we used was to use actually the geodesic distance in order to have a distribution of those curves that was kind of coherent with a shape. And we figure out that if the curves are perpendicular to the pattern of a, of a reaction diffusion, they were looking better. There were no interference between the two patterns. They were looking like they were a good match. So this is the formwork that we, that we milled. There was some coating, some uh, rebars that were bent and inserted inside the formwork. And of course, the final piece that was produced with the casting. And as you can see, because of the milling setting that we used, the layer is quite visible, but at the same time, is a texture that kind of makes sense with a, with a type of object. This is a different view. And uh, this is the second slab. Is, uh, the, the pattern is pretty similar. Uh, we use a different strategy for the milling, but the concept is kind of very similar. And the last project is this uh, polyhedral structure that is, is almost finished. And uh, polyhedral structures are structures that are interesting for an architectural point of view and an engineer engineeristic point of view because they offer opportunities to optimize the use of a material according to some specific loading condition. Uh, these open a lot of challenges on how you build those structures, especially because you may have a lot of different components that have different shapes. And also, if you want to deal with actual structure, sometimes it's recommended to use reinforced concrete. And using reinforced concrete is complicated because you have to create a formwork for the concrete, but you also need steel inside that ideally should be weld. So we came up with a solution that was 3D printing those uh, kind of three-dimensional frames that were taking some uh, plates and rebars and converging them to the center. Here you can see how they align around the center and uh, this was necessary for welding together all the rebars. The frame that you see should be open so that the operator can, of course, weld the pieces together. And also we had to 3D print some shells that were needed to close the formwork. Now, the pressure of the concrete inside those components, while still liquid, was quite high. So we had to reinforce those shells by using this pattern that was kind of giving more strength to the material without the need to increase too much. We wanted to reduce as much as possible the printing material. And we were closing the formwork. And this is the closed formwork. Then you pour the concrete from the top. And you have the final piece that is produced. As you can see, all the features of the concrete are coming from the formwork. So when you design the piece, you should think at the formwork. And when you design the formwork, this is kind of affecting the, the piece that you're producing. 
and you can see how the three-dimensional frame is generating those grooves along the geometry, and the, the curves on the shells are generating this pattern on the final piece. And uh, the formwork is quite complex, and as I mentioned, the structure has many different components. So how do you model this in a smart way so that you don't have to manually remodel for every component? And uh, as they say, if you are a number, you see nails everywhere. So my solution was to use tissue and the tessellation. So if you have like a uh, topology, which has some faces that are aligned with the features that you want, you may generate like just three simple components that contains the geometrical information for defining your formwork. And as you can see, there are three different components. Two of them are taking care of the overlap of the shells, and one is just containing the wavy shape. And the thing is that when you combine all of them together, what you get are some different geometries that then can be separated easily. What happened is also that in the component itself, there are both the parts of the formwork and the surface of the concrete. So what happened is that you see both at the same time, every iteration. So I was evaluating the aspect of a final piece of concrete and also the shape of the forward. So this was an iterative process, so I could evaluate exactly the consequences of both, on both aspects. In order to deal with that, we needed a very uh, nice topology, and we tried like remeshing, and it was not good. We tried like uh, different strategies, and we couldn't get a nice topology that was aligned exactly with our feature. So for that, I had to add another piece, a tissue, that was the polyhedral wireframe, that is basically doing what the wireframe modifier is doing, but dealing also with uh, inner faces in your geometry. All the things that usually messed up your wireframe are working fine with a polyhedral wireframe. We tried also the skin modifier that didn't work well because it creates a nice topology, but not perfect. So we added some extra strategy, extra rule, just to have like planar intersections, uh, seams between the components, because we, ha we had to use some uh, uh, flat uh, steel, and uh, there are a lot of things that you don't consider while modeling because, yeah, you see a nice shape and that's it, but then every aspect when you have to fabricate actually becomes a problem for you that you have to solve, and there were a lot of challenges to solve in this case. So this is a, a system of different components that we produce with that strategy, and we assemble a structure of three meters, more or less, that unfortunately I cannot show you because it has not been disclosed yet. So what I can show you are just some dramatic uh, renders that I did with Cycle that kind of give you the idea of uh, a more complex system while assembled. And uh, I work on, uh, in different fields and on research, education, and uh, practice. And uh, I have to say that Blender is an amazing tool for visualizing new words and new ideas, but is also a valuable tool when you actually want to produce and then fabricate the world that we are living in. And uh, I want to thank, of course, the Blender development de developer for making this amazing tool, the community for all the valuable uh, uh, feedbacks that they gave to me, and also the, my patrons that are really supporting me and giving me really the enthusiasm for continuing this project. Thank you very much.